All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our final Equal Times panel from the Congress Live Studio for the ITUC's third Congress. Today we are announcing a very important award. The winner, if winner is the correct word, Sharon, of the ITUC's World's Worst Boss. With me is the General Secretary of the ITUC, Sharon Burrow, Oka Bossinger, um, Head of UNI Commerce, and Christoph Schmidt, who is the spokesman for Verdi, the German Services Union. Now, before we actually announce the winner, Sharon, what was the idea behind a world's worst boss award? Well, corporate power, Peter, corporate power is out of control. It's actually cowering governments who, with the amount of money that goes into lobbying, the threat to take uh, action in terms of capital flight from countries, governments are cowered by the demands of corporations. Austerity has been driven by corporate power, big business, big finance, who really wanted workers to pay the price. And greed, the greed of the 1%, is now of much more interest to our governments than, in fact, the 99%. So we know that it's time we gave a message to big business. We're saying to them, back off. Just back off. You are not going to mistreat workers. You are not going to impoverish them with wages that uh, mean they can't live with dignity. And so we decided we would start exposing some of the elements of the worst boss uh, uh, phenomena. So on May 1, as well as all the other challenges, we said we're going to compile a list of uh, nine or ten of the worst bosses in the world, and we're going to put it out there for union members to vote on. All right. And how we had a short list of nine. How did we choose that list, and um, how was it compiled? Well, we did three things. We actually scanned union press because the mainstream press doesn't tell you all too often about the, uh, the you know, just un unacceptable behaviour of employers. If you take Walmart, where do you see a story that's not driven by the unions about a, an employer, the family owns the equivalent of 40% of Americans' wealth, and they actually ask for charity for their workers to have a dignified Christmas. You'll hear that story in union press all over the world. Same with Qatari Airlines, the same with, with uh, some of the uh, impacts of uh, Murdoch and the rest of them. So we scanned the union press, number one. Number two, we had a conversation with our industrial federations, the global unions federations. And then we sat down and said, where do we start? Where, what employers symbolise across the spectrum the worst tendencies, whether it's undermining democracy, undermining rights, uh, defending kafala or slavery in the case of Qatari Airways CEO. So those three elements meant we had a long list. We then had a consultation with the industrial sectors and then we ourselves tried to pick the dominant influence in the various sectors that are undermining equity and indeed uh, democracy. All right, so the nine went to an online global poll, which I understand more than 11,000 people voted on. And we came down to a final three. So we'll go through those three in some detail. Um, the first of those three is actually a former employer of mine, um, Rupert Murdoch. Um, now, he was nominated not so much for the way he um, acts as, a, as an employer, but as the way he uses his newspapers to undermine so many other workplaces and workplace campaigns and political campaigns across the world. So the high vote for Murdoch shows that it's not just an Australian phenomenon by any you know, stretch of the imagination. So what's been some of the impacts of Rupert Murdoch on working people globally over the last 12 months? Well, Rupert Murdoch was a former Australian, of course, but he ran away from Australia to go to, to register the company in Delaware because there there are fewer rules, fewer regulations, fewer requirements for paying your taxes, for acting as a good uh, company should. But Richard Murdoch has such a reach. They have such a reach. 
I always remember that when people were saying no to the Iraq war, and the, uh, the media analysts did a, uh, a survey, they found that of something like 70 editors in the Murdoch stock, 69 were running exactly the same line, exactly the same line, pro-war in Iraq. The people said no, Murdoch said yes. In Australia, we know very well that he has backed in anti-union, anti-worker, anti-inclusion governments every time. And that's the same case with his newspapers all around the world. So take on a corporation, Murdoch will be there running a story about, uh, you know, why it is that workers should be denied fundamental rights. Take on a democratic election, the Murdoch press will be there every time, absolutely pushing against the government that might actually represent the ambitions of people and greater inclusion. And of course you saw the scandal, which uh, he's not been persecuted for at all in terms of the, uh, the British uh, press that he uh, owns and influences. The corruption, the anti-democratic anti uh, uh, voices and the actual voices against fundamental rights for workers coming out of the Murdoch uh, network of press. This man has done more to damage the kind of social justice that we believe in, collective, uh, the collective voice of his press interests than probably anyone else in the world. And of course we also have that bastion of free speech, the Fox News Network. Um, streamed out of America to the globe. So, yeah, he's really um, set, the, set the scene for um, the, the, the corporate dominance of the last period. Well, and Fox News tells it all, actually, Peter, because we used to laugh at Fox News. You don't have to go back too many years, five, six years, and we'd say, this is so extreme. This is just unbelievable. It was like a comedy channel. Now it's so mainstream Scary. that people treat the discussions on Fox News as mainstream politics. It is really scary, it's really frightening. And we've got to push back on that. Can I just ask you, Alka, has um, the Murdoch um, empire translated across the English speaking world into, into the, rest of, <laughs> the rest of the world or is it still largely confined to the English speaking world? Um. I think it's still largely the English speaking world. I mean, certainly the US and Australia and New Zealand, you are covered by or you are exposed to a lot of what the Murdoch Empire is, is putting out there. But I think it's still pretty much confined to that. He's cooperating with a number of um, media outfits in other countries. But we have been lucky, I think, so far in Central Europe that we have not been exposed to too many of his bad practices. Very lucky. All right. Um, the second of our final three is an unnamed man who runs an unnamed airline operating somewhere in the Qatar region. Why the mystery here, Sharon? Well, this is Mr X. And Mr X is actually the CEO of Qatar Airways. His name is, uh, in fact, uh, Al Bakar. And he runs Qatar Airways. But he tells the world that, uh, in fact, everything, everything that's a problem is union related. He's actually said the problem with Western uh, countries is that they allow unions. This man is a defender of the kafala system. And I have to say, he's on record in uh, the press out of Scandinavia, actually telling women that they don't have rights. They don't have rights when it comes to sexual oppression and worse. He actually imposes a curfew on his own workers, women workers, who service uh, the planes of Qatari Airways. And of course, he's one of the elite in Qatar who do nothing, nothing to raise their voice against modern day slavery. So the International Transport Federation, they know and have run a campaign around Qatari Airways and the oppression of workers now for more than 12 months. This man is not an employer, is not an employer that actually has any care or concerns for the rights or indeed the living standards of working people. All right, so now for the drum roll, the winner of the worst of the worst bosses in the world is Sharon? Mr. Amazon. Jeff Bezos. Um, now, when I think of Amazon, I think of a website, a credit card and a book on the doorstep, but there's much more to the company, isn't there? It's an extraordinary story, really. 
you know, Amazon operating right here in Germany, and we hold up the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries and Germany as the kind of bastion, really, of decency. Because right here in Germany, you have uh, companies that uh, have co-determination, where unions actually uh, join forces with the employers on their advisory bodies. You have a respect for collective bargaining. You have respect for fundamental rights. And yet Amazon, operating, operating right here in Germany, treats its workers as if they were robots. They work how many, walk how many kilometres a day, is it? It's an extraordinary number. 20 kilometres a day with monitors. They're actually monitored for their performance as if they were robots. And you know what? The company makes no secret that, in fact, within, uh, within just a few years, they will, in fact, replace these human beings with robots. This is appalling. Again, an American corporation, a very rich corporation, operating globally with absolute disdain for any fundamental dignity or rights for working people. And it's happening right here in Germany. So I have to say, I'm delighted, and so will uh, Uni Global Union, who actually organises the service workers. I'm delighted that this man has actually won the worst boss of the, the year, because he, without doubt, represents the level of, uh, of inhumanity that employers who are promoting the American corporate model, members of the American Chamber of Commerce Club, are taking to the world. And we will push back. Alka, um, you've been looking at the operations globally and, and through Europe. What is it about this company that um, seems so innovative and forward-looking um, that it doesn't translate to um, tr good treatment of the employee employees. What's going on with the company, do you think? Well, I think the company has been very, very smart in terms of taking advantage of customers' desire to just uh, make an order uh, from the um, uh, comfort of their home. You just sit there, you order something very uh, comfortably with your credit card, and then you can sit and wait um, for something to be delivered to your door. Um, the difficulty that I think we have in terms of customers understanding what's happening at, the, um, at Amazon is that it's not the Amazon's employees that are coming to your door to give you your parcel. What you're seeing is somebody working for the post office who's looking on your door, who in many countries is treated in a proper way, and nobody is really so much aware of how the parcels are being packed in these um, Amazon, uh, in, in, in the Amazon centers. And Amazon has been um, at the forefront, really, of well, trying to shape a new way of, um, of an, the new economy that we're, we've been talking about so much here. And I think exactly the, the model that Amazon has been uh, promoting and pushing is not the model of the new economy that we want to see. We're absolutely against the way how Amazon is pushing employers to their absolute physical and mental uh, limits. Sharon was talking about the amount of um, ground that employees have to cover in each uh, shift, the monitoring that is going on there. But there are more physical needs also that are um, included here because these Amazon centers are absolutely gigantic. So if you, um, during your shift, want to take a toilet break, it's almost impossible to do that because the time that you have to do that, it takes you to walk for kilometers to get to the toilet room and come back. The same for their lunch breaks. You spend most of your time walking to and from the place that is supposed to be a restful place, um, and you just don't get uh, any rest. I also you love the way they've used language to shape. It's no longer a warehouse, it's a fulfillment center. Yes. So what happens in a fulfillment centre? Yeah, I, I don't think it's really a question of fulfillment for the workers there. It's, I think, a question of uh, filling Amazon's pockets and the, uh, those of, uh, of Amazon's shareholders. Um, the, the motto of, uh, of, the Amazon, uh, of Amazon and the Amazon CEO about working hard, having fun uh, at work, I don't think that is something that can be said for the workers at Amazon because they are really being pushed to their limits every single day. So, so beyond filling boxes with orders, the workers are also effectively data collection, human data collection centres. So everything they're doing is being captured, analysed, 
you would imagine so that at some point they will be automated and automated out of the business. That's exactly what Amazon is trying to do, and that's why uh, the, 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 the workers here in, in, uh, in Germany are speaking about being treated like robots because every step of their way is being monitored. The scanners that they're carrying around with them tells them how much time they have to find a certain item, pick it out and put it into the, the trolley that they're pushing around. Um, every single uh, diversion from this, um, the goal that are, the targets that are being set by the scanner um, is being punished by the supervisor. So this is really something, it's, it's like a modern day slave factory that we haven't seen uh, anywhere else. And of course in North America there were issues with um, people collapsing because it was so hot and then at various other times needing um, it being too cold. Is, are those issues occurring as well in the German warehouses? Absolutely, that's an issue that we have find, found all over the place. We had stories from the US, from France, from uh, the UK, here in Germany, and um, my colleague from Verdi can speak to that. But we have issues with very, very hot warehouses in the summer and very cold, cold warehouses uh, in the winter. Um, in some places, Amazon has actually installed air conditioning, but because there's so much into cost saving, they're just not switching them on, but they can tell the public, oh, we have air conditioning, because usually the next question is not, are you using them? Christoph, um, Verdi organised workers in um, the German fulfilment centres. Um, how did the American model of fulfilment go down with, with your members? So, Amazon is very tricky in that. Amazon is looking for places for the warehouses where is a very high unemployment rate. And so, people in the first step are very happy and lucky to get a job is all. But this isn't a job you can compare to any, everything Sharon and uh, Alke told you about the immense pressure who is on the people uh, walking 10 to 15 miles per shift and uh, in every condition and uh, even in these hot days uh, if they don't switch off the air condition uh, they don't repair broken air conditions so we want to get the usual German labor standards as well as uh, also for the Amazon workers. And in Germany, the standard is a collective bargaining agreement. Um, but Amazon denies any negotiation, and I think they are backed, probably they are forced by the Seattle management and even by Jeff Bezos to deny these negotiations. And that's not a simple thing. They don't pay too bad, but they pay worse than other retail, uh, online retailers or stationary retail uh, employers. But and it's not only a problem for the employ employees, but it's also a problem of competition. They lower the standards of the whole retail sector in Germany if they succeed in establish these bad working condi conditions and lower wages here in Germany. So you organised strikes in two of the, um, the centres. How, what was the um, outcome of those pieces of industrial action? We started industrial action almost a year, a year ago, on May 14th last year. We started in two of the warehouses, two of the, the facilities, because we were organized there as well, so that strikes had an impact, a low impact, but an impact on Amazon. Uh, in December, in the Christmas season, that's high business for Amazon, we uh, uh, the, the workers of a third uh, facility in Bavaria joined the strikes and we are sure, I'm, very, I'm convinced, in very short time, it's more a thing of weeks, not of months, we'll get the fourth facility where we can uh, get our members call, call to action, call to strike. Um, Amazon demands very flexible work by its employees. and. Our answer are very flexible strikes, so they can't rely on the, the workflow every day. We look for very uh, popular uh, computer games or very popular books which are for, for first release, and we look for these days to go, go on strike, and we'll continue till Amazon will sit with us at the same desk and will negotiate about a collective bargaining agreement. And what's the response from workers that this company that's employing them in Germany 
is actually based the European operations in Luxembourg, the lowest tax haven in the place. Is, is that seen as part of the, the lack of respect as well? Yes, that's, that's the main reason. The, the Amazon attitude lacks respect and esteem towards the employees. And um, even the working conditions and the wage conditions are very difficult because um, Amazon makes much money with the work of the employees and pays, doesn't pay any taxes here in Germany. They all, uh, it all flows out of, of the country. Um, but they employ very, very many uh, in Christmas season up to 10,000 and more workers with fixed term contracts. They don't have any perspective for their future. They can't rely on any regular income. But Amazon makes big money with this. And we want a, a collective agreement because that's the only guarantee, that's the only protection for workers, that they have fair wages and good working conditions. That's the guarantee and not this form of despotism, one-sided uh, decision by Amazon because they want to change, to have the opportunity to change working conditions and wages any time they want. And that's not okay, that's not the German standard, that's not the German standard for workers, not for unions. And we will teach Amazon this lesson. Of course, Sharon, Amazon's not just a book distributor. This is a company that is growing exponentially every year. They're moving into home delivery of groceries, um, there, there's talk that at some point they're going to have drones that automatically drop things at your doorstep. So how important is it for the union movement to at, at one of these new economy, 21st century companies that we actually get a handle on them in the early days and, and, and get a, a global presence in there? Well, it's critical. You've got uh, now this, this is a mega logistics company. That's the way you have to describe it. It would uh, like you to think it was still soft and fluffy with uh, coffee shops and books and, you know, the fulfilment centre term I haven't heard before, Peter. I must say it makes me laugh, but in a really c cynical way. How on earth can anybody think it's reasonable to call what is an oppressive sweatshop set of conditions in the in the one of the richest countries in the world, a fulfilment centre for goodness sake. But, you know, if we don't organise collectively these, these companies and, and Amazon, Jeff Bezos knows exactly what he's doing. He's taking the American corporate model, anti-union, anti-collective agreement, no regulatory environment, low tax uh, uh, um, compliance and trying to export that model to the world. And nobody else will, will stand up if we don't. If we don't stand up, if we don't say back off, if we don't organise, and if we have to get consumer power to stop these companies making the profits, then frankly it's working people, their families, their communities and ultimately their democracies that are at risk. So we, we think very carefully about these things, but we know we have to internationalise to the extent we've never thought about it before. Alka, does you and I have a global strategy for a company like Amazon? We're in the process of developing one. And I think what the global, global labour movement and particularly uh, Industrial and Uni have shown with the Bangladesh Accord is that we are able to uh, completely change the approach and the attitude of companies to the responsibility that they have for their supply chain, for the entire value chain. And that is something that as a global labour movement we need to do also with Amazon. We need to talk about everything from where the products that Amazon is, uh, is selling are being manufactured to the delivery of these products at the door and that's what we're going to do together. And Peter, can I add that these companies, and if you go back to Mr Al Bakar, but uh, Jeff Bezos, any of them, they actually want credibility. They want to be known for great corporate uh, men, mostly men, I was about to say men and women, mostly men, around the world. They're fated by governments, but when you expose their bad behaviour, when you expose their bad behaviour, then you get the response we got from Al Bakar. I'm going to sue you. You can't say these things about me. Well, the truth is we can and we will. If that behaviour is uh, the truth, if, it, if what they say is public, 
then we will speak out. But it's intriguing, isn't it, that they'll use every amount they can generate to stop regulation, to stop laws that actually uh, stop their bad behaviour. But when you try to expose them, oh, they're so offended that you might actually call them out on bad reputational behaviour. And Christoph, for your members in the Amazon fulfilment centres in Germany, how do you think they'll react to the knowledge that they are now working for the world's worst boss? Uh, that's a difficult um, impression for them because uh, it's good f that many of them like to go to work. It's good that people have work and that it's paid and that they have a chance to make a living out of it. But they want respect and they want a guarantee and a life perspective, a f perspective for the future. They have families they have uh, to care for and so it, it's fine if Jeff Bezos takes his billion money and makes something good with it, but he has to make first his homework. That's that's our working conditions, the, wa uh, the wages at Amazon. And so I hope that many of, of Verdi members at Amazon and especially the unorganized workers at Amazon. We try to talk to them. We, res we respect their work, and that's the reason why we want that they are paid correctly, that they have good working conditions. I'll give you one example. It's incredible that we talked about the monitoring, the continuously monitoring. One worker at the Leipzig facility got a written call to order for a, a double inactivity in, a, in five minutes. You can't even think about that. That's You blow your nose and scratch your neck, and that's inactivity, inactivity. at work. <laughs> double inactivity twice in five minutes. That's incredible. We got legal action against this, and it's, it, it couldn't stand for, for the, at, at court. But that's the, the thinking, that's the attitude of Amazon, and that's no respect before, for, for workers. And I think most of the German Amazon workers and the Verde Union members at Amazon, they don't want more than that. Respect, fair, guaranteed wages, a collective agreement. And um, so it's a good sign that uh, ITUC now has named Jeff Bezos as that what he is, as a person who wants to, uh, to weaken unions, to weaken uh, workers' rights, and we have to stand against that. So, Sharon, this is going to be um, an annual award, the world's worst boss? Well, we'll have a think about that. What I can promise you, though, is that we're going to continue to expose the behaviour continue to expose the behaviour of all these mega employers, big business, big finance. We won't accept a world where people are robots. We won't accept a world where the profits are the ultimate ambition of corporations. I mean, even Henry Ford, and he had his uh, faults, knew that if workers didn't earn enough so that they could live with dignity and actually buy his products, then it wasn't worth being in business. Well. That's the mentality that we have to drive. But, you know, Verdi's right. We expect better from these corporations and we demand respect. And we demand respect for dignity and for rights. We want fair wages out of the profits they make and we want to ensure that workers have the social protection that should be afforded every worker everywhere in the world. So, that's our, uh, that's our set of demands, and certainly where we have to call out bosses for bad behaviour, we'll continue to do it, Peter. Well, on that note, um, congratulations to Amazon from all of us for um, winning the World Worst Boss. I don't know if there's a, a trophy or a little certificate or something that will be going well, in the mail to Mr Bezos? Well, I think we'll certainly put one on the website oh, okay. and we'll write to Mr it. Bezos yeah. and tell him that, uh, you know, workers of the world at the World's Workers Parliament here have said this behaviour is unacceptable. And we'll tell him how he can redeem himself because... Maybe he wants a second chance. Just maybe, Verdi, you can make him want a second chance and all strength to your arm.
We do our best. <laughs> and I'm sure that, you know, Mr Qatar Airways and Rupert Murdoch oh. won't take their second and third places lying down anyway, so maybe next year we'll, we'll see a reordering. And so Ms Mr Qatar Airways, we never give up. We will see the end of slavery, of the kafala system. We will see it off both in Qatar and right throughout the world where anybody, anybody thinks that it's uh, OK to, to enslave workers, to use forced labour, modern day slavery, it's simply not on. All right, well, thank you, Christoph and Alka. Um, there is time for journalists. If anyone would like to ask a question of anyone on the panel, they can either do it from the floor now or once we're, once we're off. I think we've got a couple more minutes of streaming. So, yeah, Mark, do you want to come up and grab a microphone and enter the global stream of this, this august event? This is a, a very important event and um, I have to ask you a technical question. You have now declared the worst boss in the world, but Ms. Burrell, you never actually said it. The oh. moderator said it. So if you wouldn't mind, who is the worst boss in the world? Workers have determined that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, right here today is the worst boss in the world. Workers are not robots. They won't be treated as robots. And Amazon, if you think you can use your corporate power to subject workers here in Germany, here in Germany, to the status of robots, then we say to you, back off. How's that for a leading question, eh? <laughs> Anything else? Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Oh, really? Oh, yes, we have no idea.